So welcome to After Hours by Red Compass Labs, where the best and brightest of the financial services industry let their hair down, unbutton their collars, and share their passion for payments. I'm Mike Truter, Director of Digital Ecosystems and Innovation at Red Compass Labs. And in each episode, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Julie Guetta. Let's kick things off. We're thrilled today to have not one, but two special guests. I'm super excited to welcome Paula Hunter, Executive Director, and Leslie Ann Bourne, Director of Product Strategy from the Modulu Foundation. For those not yet familiar with Modulu, have no fear. In just a few minutes with Paula and Leslie Ann's help, you'll know all about their mission to advance financial inclusion. And they're not just talking about it, they're actually doing it. Now, this is supposed to be an after hours chat, but with this group split across the continents of North America, Europe, and Asia, it's perfect listening for any time of day where I'm in Singapore. Uh, it's almost time for a nightcap, but Paula, it's still early in the morning where you are. What, what drink gets you going in the morning? I have a Nespresso cappuccino, uh, just fresh off the machine. I'll probably have another one after this call. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I might need one of those as well to keep me up and awake. But hopefully the topic will cover that. Leslie Ann, uh, it's just after midday in the UK. What tipple are you looking forward to at the end of the day? At the end of the day, after the day is over, maybe a cup of tea will get me started, but, but then maybe a gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Now that sounds good now as well. Okay, let's get down <laughs> to business. Today we want to talk about the extremely broad and important topic of financial inclusion with Paula and Leslie Ann. So our, our conversation has plenty of room to roam. However, there is one rule like the Scottish knife, the ski and do. We need to try and keep things short, sharp, and to the point. So without any script or preparation, let's see where the conversation takes us. There's the end. Maybe I can start with you. Let me open by asking, surely in this day and age, everyone has access to financial services. So what's the problem? Why, why is there this focus on financial inclusion? Well, you'd think that maybe we all do have access these days, but the reality is we don't. There's an awful lot of mobile money accounts that have been created in the last 10 years. There's a lot of activity happening, but there's a lot of dormant accounts out there as well. And the big question is why? And quite often it's because cash is just the great leveler. It's still the most interoperable way of sending money and moving money around. And cash is still king. That's the reality. But the reality is if you, if you leave things in the world of cash, how do you help people on their journey to financial independence? And so there's a need for us to think about how do we move on this journey towards more digital money and how do we use less cash in the world so that people have some kind of formal footprint that helps them with their independence. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Paula, okay, so we, we understand financial inclusion is a critical problem for 1.7 billion people. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about Modulup and what your team is trying to do to address the challenge. Sure. So when, when we looked at financial inclusion, and this is uh, a, a dream that came out of the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to address financial inclusion, they said, how can we change the, the access to financial services to the unbanked and underbanked? And what we found is there's a lot of big actors in the financial services sector that we're not servicing that, that spectrum of audience. And because, you know, perhaps it was hard to get to that last mile to reach them. You know, there's not a bank branch on every street corner in Kenya or, or uh, Tanzania. And they also wanted to uh, make sure that there's a way to deliver those services at a lower cost, the lowest possible transaction cost that they could deliver, uh, which is not necessarily very appealing to the, the large multinational yeah. financial sector. Uh, so if we could reduce the costs and barriers to deploying uh, the financial underpinnings, the plumbing for these types of transactions, uh, we could reduce some of the, the costs associating with delivering those services to the last mile. So that's why we chose an open source model to develop the Mojaloop software platform, which provides that plumbing. Uh, and, and then we can let the marketplace use it with no licensing fees, uh, the freedom to deploy it as they see fit, but also participate in a community that continues to enhance and maintain the code base. Yeah, excellent idea. Because 
the, the way I understand it today, you have these fragmented ecosystems with you know money trapped in maybe a mobile money system, and then you've got like the, the formal financial system over here with scheme A, and then you've got some other wallet solution over there with you know something else. That's the challenge, right? That's what you're trying to solve. Exactly. Linking those yeah. together and making that seamless. The, the reality is if you're if you're a poor person today, you go to your microfinance institution to get a loan for your business. You might have a mobile money account to send money to your mum up the country. You will likely have SACO accounts to do kind of savings in a cooperative group model. And beyond that, you will have, you know, maybe up to 15 different ways that you and your community are are holding assets to liabilities with different people and different institutions. You also probably go and queue to pay some of your bills. And you're always thinking about where is all your pockets of money so that you can run your business. You might also be brought a, an opportunity to become an agent for mobile money systems. And you have to hold liquidity there as well. And so you're holding money in so many different places in the financial ecosystem for different reasons. And fundamentally, this is about connecting these ecosystems together and making it far easier to know where your money is and use it in the right way. It's gonna take a long time to get there, but it's fundamentally about connecting those silos together. And, and there is some cost implication as well, right? Because today, like technically, you have some solution where somehow you can take the money out of one pocket and like send it to another pocket. But because of the lack of interoperability between these two pockets, the cost of doing it is like very prohibitive, right? Especially like at the end of the day, we are talking at solution for finance for the poor. So effectively where every single penny like comes. So I think like this is for me what is very revolutionary in what Mojero is trying to do is like thinking about interoperability, but also this, this cost. And I think for me, like, and Mike, this is often something we discuss together, right? Cost and margin. So mm. lower the cost, you can actually like, you know, lower the price to market and still recognize the same margin. So for me, like, you know, it's, it's really a tool that actually could be an enabler for new business proposition as well. Yeah, Julie, yeah, like, I'm glad you brought that up. Sorry, Mike, I, no, I just no, wanted to okay. expand on that because I mean, if you think about it in real terms, someone that makes $100 a month, that's their total income. And every time they want to pay a bill or transfer money to someone else or make a purchase, there's a transaction cost. So if, if it ends up being 10% over the course of the month, they've lost $10 of their income. When you only have $100 to live off of, that's a, that's a significant chunk. So having that interoperability reduces those, the number of transaction costs that someone's going to feel every time they perform a financial transaction. Yeah, and I, I think, of course, today with cash, we, we don't recognize that transaction fee, right? When you hand over money. Right. I, I, but I there is one. It, it, there, there is, is one. one. Absolutely. So there is one, like, you know, there could one, there is one potentially to do to the merchants, like, you know, in some of the scenarios to manage this cash and so on, right? Cash, cash is not necessarily free actually all the time. Well, they just and, don't, you don't recognize it or don't feel it as much, I guess. Is that, right. That's the problem, right? Right. And not to mention right now in the height of COVID, and let's hope we're on the back, the tail end of it, um, cash is dirty. I um, mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a transmission of germs. And it's also harder for governments and other aid agencies to distribute cash out into the marketplace during times of pandemic. So a lot of governments are looking at it and say, how can we reduce the dependencies on cash so that people don't have to you know, touch it? Um, there is also a notion of safety, right? So right. maybe it's because I'm a woman, but like, you know, walking in the street, lots of cash on me and so on, I don't really feel comfortable as well. And I mean, like I live in a pretty safe area and still I feel like, you know, not safe, like carrying a lot of cash. So I think for me, like with digital payments, you solve a lot of this problem around like safety. Yeah. So actually, while we're talking about cash, we mentioned cash is king. I think, you know, there's this term, Julie keeps using these big terms that, that you know, I, I always want to understand instant push payments as this replacement. So it's not cash. We need to think about instant push payments. What are instant push payments and why does that matter? 
So yep. back in 2007, when the team were behind MPESA, first created MPESA, and um, we were fundamentally trying to digitize the microfinance sector and make things far more efficient. So this is about giving people back their time. Mm -hmm. But we knew that fundamentally we needed to model the experience, the important elements of what a cash transaction gives a customer. So you're in complete control when you hand cash over. You give the cash, that's when the cash moves. And also when you receive the cash, you can spend it right away. And those two elements were fundamental to us creating that closed loop MPESA push payment system. Instantly, with the right software in behind it, we were using SMS technology to make sure that that person definitely knew the money moved and that person definitely knew that the money arrived before they left each other's company. And as a consequence, they could then spend and see balance updates right away. And what we're talking about in instant push payments in an interoperable space is making that across an ecosystem just as reliable and, and, and dependable as it is within a closed loop ecosystem of many of the push payment systems today. So that's how I think about, about push payments in this ecosystem. It's fundamentally different to how we think about cards. Cards start from the merchant perspective and they're a pool payment, which is fundamentally different to what, what we work on here with the Imagine Foundation. Okay. Yeah, you, you mentioned the, the kind of closed loop, but I, I know you also speak about this concept of open loop rails. So mm -hmm. what exactly does this mean? And why is that so important as part of this discussion? Well, there's quite a lot of boundaries to barriers to entry in, an, in, in a typical payment scheme. You've got to think a lot about what it takes to join a scheme. And there's often a lot of um, compliance checks. There's lots of requirements on you. And, and often you have to be a bank. <laughs> what happens if you bring um, the barriers to entry down? What happens if you really think about open it, meaning any regulated entity can be part of that conversation? So you bring microfinance, SACOs, mobile money companies, and banks all to the same rails. And as a consequence, each of those institutions can interoperate with each other and their customer base can never interoperate with each other in an open loop way. Okay, so SACOs are savings cooperatives, right? Is that, is that? Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. okay, groups of people getting together to pull their money and, and build communities. Of, and fundamentally, that's actually where Impesa started. We started by digitizing, using the great mean model around how people save together as much as how they, they spend. So store and save and spend spend and receive loans. Those, those fundamentals all require money movements as a consequence, even within that group. Okay. And I think for me, when I, when I think about like, you know, the concept of open loop, I also think of the Maasai community, you know, which is like across several borders and like, you could be living within the same community and actually not being in the position where you want to send money to your neighbor easily, right? So I think by like, you know, looping people into the concept of, like I said, the components that create interoperability, really this is where you create inclusion or, you know, right, and a loop per se. And a, a big part of our vision as well is um, internet of payments. How do you loop networks mm -hmm. to each other? And how does the protocols in behind that work? Because schemes mm -hmm. often are hub and spoke and how do the policies map across different schemes? We think a lot about kind of making sure that our schemes are, are kind of compatible to each other. So it feels like a, a loop of loops. <laughs> One question from my side, maybe, because like you mentioned push payment and I'm, I, Mike always says that it's true, like I'm a huge advocate of push payment all in all. And one of the themes is like around security, right? Of, if I compare push payment versus card payment, like often a push payment is, is, is more or less more secure. Like how are you planning to solve this? And especially like, you know, when you're looking at interoperability, so different security standards and so on. So if I go into the depths of the technology, there's a few layers to our, our security model. And it starts obviously with the customer and it starts with, with what banks do naturally anyway. They have, they have pin-based authorization for their customer accounts, they, they are still in control of that model as part of this story. But what we're also adding in via our three PPI, our third-party payment initiation API, 
is a biometric possibility for authentication using FIDO on the devices as a way for a bank to understand an extra credential as part of them choosing to do the push payment. So fundamentally, they, the, the debit organization and the credit organization are in charge of that security model for the customers. But then in below that, we also use something called interledger protocol. And as a consequence of that, um, this helps us know with cryptographic security that that banking institution absolutely did send that request to the network and the receiving institution absolutely did receive it and agree to it as part of our protocol. So the protocol is more than just an API, it's a set of steps that we expect both actors to, to kind of abide by. And as a consequence, the, the hub software kind of is the authoritative source of yes, you absolutely did both agree to that and therefore let's go, it's straight through processing and let's do settlement. So it's like a contract, you're agreeing the contract yes. effectively the yes. terms and then the settlement uh, occurs based on Exactly. That. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And then in below that, we also have all kinds of layers of JWT and <laughs> normal um, standards based TLS and authorization protocols and things. So the security is incredibly important to the community and a big part of what the payments expertise in our community brings to the story. And I think that's one of the benefits of working in a community model that actually any scheme that wants to do this well starts with a base of a standards based um, composition where a lot of these things have been thought through on behalf of the scheme. And then schemes can actually work with each other to make sure that as a global movement that, that there is, there is um, strength and cybersecurity by design. I think like, you know, as I mentioned on my side, I'm a huge fan of the, of the product and what you're trying to achieve. I loved your white paper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. It was like, you know, I, I, I think, I think for me, like I was reading this and I was thinking, yeah, exactly. All the elements of a good payment system in there, right? So inclusivity, security, based on like push payment, confirmation of pay in there. But, so, and, but the hard bit is, that the transformation towards an open source model is so nascent um, that, that that model of getting it to market is, is, is complicated. Yeah. And the, the protocol itself, I therefore see success, even if we manage to say, Do you know what, this is a really good protocol and these are good APIs. You and your proprietary system should be thinking about these things. And then if they actually get as far as joining the open source and consuming the software is one thing. And the next thing is the contribution back model where they actually completely understand the, the kind of the OSS model as part of the story. And um, we've run a journey, run a journey with emerging markets, payment infrastructure players toward full adoption of, of the open source way of, of, of developing Software. Yeah, and I think, Julie, you and I talked about this when you're in Boston. There's a misconception that because it's free li freely licensed, that no one can make any money. Um, mm -hmm. And we're not asking people to do pro bono work to do these installs. I mean, if, if uh, you know, a central bank needs help in designing and implementing their, their MojoLoop instance, they're willing to pay for it. And if they don't have the funds, there are aid organizations out there their philanthropies that will grant monies or provide uh, low interest loans to central banks. So the, the ecosystem that supports and, and deploys these solutions can have a healthy business in, in being Mojulu proficient and helping people employ, just deploy them. It's, it's, we're not asking folks to discount their fees or do pro bono mm -hmm. work because the, the banks themselves recognize it takes specialized expertise to, to deploy and operate these, these um, platforms. It's the, the licensing and the ongoing maintenance and enhancement of the platform that we're cu cutting costs out of. It's a funny thing. You, you mentioned right at the beginning about you know, banks not, not going after the um, kind of unbanked market because there's no money to be made. Well, actually, you're lowering the cost of making money for, for banks. So it makes it makes sense, right? If right. Changes the enough, actually, yeah. Suddenly they've they've got an interest in hold on a second, there's an untapped market and I can make, you know, I, hopefully I ethical I, yeah. revenue. 
Yeah. I, I think you know what you're trying to do is like you're kind of bursting a lot of myths in one go, right? Because like collaboration in the industry often is like, oh no, I don't want to collaborate. <laughs> like I won't be able to make any money if I start collaborating. And here you go. Not only it's an open source solution, but you can actually like yeah lower the down yeah. the cost and like preserving the margin. So uh, it yeah, requires. It requires collaboration, but it also requires them to collaborate on new scheme roles because fundamentally what we do is like, like Paula says, we reduce licensing costs and maintenance costs. We create you a community of those who can actually do this thing. And we also reduce integration costs because we've got these tools mm -hmm. that, that help banks get quickly connected. And we've actually got pre-integration for platforms like Mambu as part of the story. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of places where we reduce costs, but we do not change the scheme roles they are the decisions of the local players. And so the local players have to innovate on their business model and realize that if they reduce the fees, it changes the game. And this, for the actually one of the good things about COVID, um, during COVID times, Safaricom was asked to reduce their fees on merchant payments because of cash and all those kind of things. So they reduced their fees for a long period it completely changed the volumes on merchant payments when the fees uh, went back in. Supply versus um, demand. Yeah. And it's it's that moment of realizing that fees are actually, a customers are savvy, right? They haven't got much money. And so if you keep the fees high because that's your revenue model and you're worried about losing your existing revenue models and your business model works that way, if you <laughs> don't, actually hit your own margins and think about the bigger disruption, the bigger case, you actually lose out in the long term. But but the schemes have to make these decisions. And that's not the Mojilip Foundation to make decisions on that for them. So there's a lot of advocacy work that's done by others on this kind of level of conversation. And, and now the evidence is coming through. If you start to make things free to consumers, it changes the game. But actually but you need a different as well. business model probably you, you do. need to think about other opportunities and, out of that and the reality is that that a non-bank player like a mobile money company their revenue models today are based around fees for transactions because it was innovative when we started in pesta you had to pay monthly bank fees you had to pay this you had to pay that and, and nobody wanted to kind of get involved in that game actually we were completely innovative only pay if you use it but now we, <laughs> the world is is going to the next level of open banking and fintech and everything else but but you've got to figure out what your business model is if you aren't a bank how do you make money and think about the adjacencies and think about whether you can change the model so that your your supply side can actually get into your business model rather than fees for services from end customers and and it it takes a bit of it takes a bit of strategizing and a bit of thought and a lot of time so it's not going to happen quickly but schemes change their game and 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 um, don't charge customers overnight i guess like another question i have for you is i saw uh, mike actually um so recently like you know the pan-african the pass the pan-african like system Paps. 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 yeah sorry so basically, like, how does it impact your roadmap and, like, does it impact your roadmap in any sense? Would it simplify Make it easier, world? right? You've only got one oh. point to integrate with and you get all these countries. At the end of the day, we're open source software, right? So whose roadmap does it affect? Ours or our adopters? And I think it's the latter, to be honest. What I'd love to do is work with Pats to make sure that if... If PAPS is providing a real service on the ground that our adopters of Mojolip care to, to have, well, maybe that is the story around what cross-border and open loop looks like. And, and that's where I get a little bit excited about the fact we are not settlement. We are last mile clearing and uh, we need settlement rails that work in an African context. And maybe PAPS is that story. So I, I'm very curious to see how do we, how do we work together um, I know that they work very closely with the folk behind Mansa ID, and uh, they think a lot about cross-border trade. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that, that's one use case. We want to be a horizontal service that's, that gets the whole thing connected. I'd like to connect to their roadmap, and I'd like to make sure that our adopters think about Modulip in their roadmap. <laughs> Yeah, because it was very interesting to see the way they were focused on on trade as their their objective, mm -hmm. right? It's about cross border yeah. trade and making it easy to to enable cross border you, the payments. Because you can see a business the, case. The, the, the DBP. 
A um, lot of um, Modulip adopters look at cross-border use cases because there is an ability to price into the business case around FX margins and, and things like that. And, and there's a big unsolved problem in an African context. You have 52 countries. Mm. And every country's got its own regulations and every country's got its own way of doing payments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a massive fragmentation problem that, that perhaps has a mission around and a lot of um, donor support actually around as well. So um, we're very keen to see how do we, how do we fit in our story and, and be part of the domestic story. Yeah, I was, I was super excited as an African. I was super excited when I saw that. I was jumping up and down. <laughs> It's like this is going to change the game. <laughs> Think about the potential of the market if trade can flourish and money does yeah. start yeah. to move across borders, and you know that that's what yeah. builds economies. Exactly right? right. And I'm very, very keen to see a cross-border merchant story happen, where I can, as a Kenyan, travel and still spend money in my wallet and not need to do this whole cash in, cash out thing. You know. The cross-border merchant interoperability story is going to be a real future thing. Game changer, right? Um, and I think exactly that. And I think there's a role for an open source foundation in that story alongside things like PAPS. And then, you know, Rwanda is interoperable payments and Kamesa interoperable payments. And you know, everyone has their own story and they all connect together. And, and some good principles around discovery agreement transfer will actually create a very robust system as we go. There's another new organization, have you heard of, Africa Nenda? Yes. Okay. They're about to launch, um, they're one to watch as well, um, a new organizations who are out there to support schemes with deciding on their instant interoperable payment solutions. Maybe, Paula, if I can ask a question. We've been talking about community. How, how much of a struggle is it convincing people to, to kind of interact, you know, and, and get, get the right people at the right level to, to join the movement and participate? Yeah, so I think there's uh, quite a few different actors that are in that mix right now in our community. Uh, we have the core developers that have been with us for quite some time. And so their companies and their development teams are very entrenched in our, our, in our work. And they've met face-to-face -face, uh, probably a half dozen times before uh, we, we couldn't travel. So they know each other. There's a camaraderie there and uh, a real strong community spirit amongst you know, probably 50, 60 core people that have been with us from the start. Then what happens is, is we start talking to companies like Google or Microsoft that have technologies that fit in with Modulop. Either, you know, either we're deploying with their technology or they want to leverage our rails. And so typically what happens is if they see synergies from a technical standpoint, those large technology companies know the open source methodology pretty well. They're very active contributors. So as long as we can have a match of value, okay, we have technology, you have technology, there's a fit to collaborate. That's a pretty easy ask. Where it becomes a little more challenging is at the end customer level because customers are used to being sold to by their vendors. But the, yeah. you know, the, 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 the benefit of an open source methodology is that the customers can have a more closer relationship with the developers and the roadmap. So what we found is as, as companies start the work to deploy Mojaloop, it's not an overnight thing. I mean, they have a lot of planning and preparation to deploy a Mojaloop environment. That's when they start having questions and they talk talking to the developers and making suggestions, making asks. And then all of a sudden they realize, well, wait, we can do that too. So they become more engaged with the open source community as they can become more involved in the code base. Uh, what it also does is reduces maintenance and, and new feature costs for them because they're not necessarily paying a vendor to do it. Their developers can do it. They can make that contribution. So when we can get to that aha moment with, with a, you know, a central bank or a fintech or other type of user of Bojloop, that's when we can convert them into community members. But at the very least, what we do is we invite them to our, our well, meetings with our community that are four times a year and say, so, you know, you don't have to be active participant, but sit in, we'll talk, let, let us talk about the different work streams and how they might impact you. And that's when they start getting a little more comfortable with this open source model. 
but it, it is a shift in thinking for the end user, if you will. Mm -hmm. And depending on what region you're in, open source has evolved more rapidly in the United States and Europe. And so it's just, it's a learning curve, but there's plenty of, you know, background history of, of successes around the world that we can point to. But then it really comes down to relationships, the getting, getting the technologists in a room together, you know, li literally or figuratively, um, and, and recognizing they have common purpose. And, and that's where we see things really start to accelerate. I love that relationship point. You've got communities and relationships and people bind it all together, right? It's, uh, right. it's people right. working with people, supporting other people, mm -hmm. being, being human beings, right? Uh, yeah. Community is what drives us. Paula, Leslie, and thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure discussing this life-changing topic with you. It really can change people's lives. I think it's often difficult for many to grasp the challenges faced by those excluded from financial ecosystems or paying hefty transaction fees to compensate for fragmented payment platforms. At Red Compass Labs, we say that two sides of payments, a good side and a bad side. That bad side doesn't only refer to financial crime, as most people think, but also to friction that unfairly disadvantages those on a low income, as well as barriers to entry for those who are financially excluded. For this reason, we really are encouraged by the work Montelup is doing in the space and are actively looking for opportunities to help, help you drive this initiative forward. And uh, of course, we encourage others to do the same as well. We also really appreciate the support of our audience. If you've enjoyed this discussion, then please show your support by giving us a thumbs up, hitting subscribe and clicking on the bell to get notified when new content arrives in future. Also, please don't be shy about giving us any feedback. We really appreciate your comments and of course, suggestions for new topics and guests. That's all for this week. Catch you on the flip side. <laughs>a few times CBDC within, within mm. the white paper. Actually, you mentioned it twice. I counted it. <laughs> uh, I think it was I hint, I hint to it. <laughs>